Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of President Lambert and the faculty, staff, and students of Elon University, and especially the law school, I am pleased to welcome you tonight to the Joseph M. Bryan Lecture. We're delighted that you've come to participate in what promises to be a really exciting and thought-provoking evening. The Bryan Leadership Lectures bring to our law school distinguished leaders to share with us their insights on this vital yet often inexplicable thing we call leadership. We are especially fortunate tonight to have one of the nation's most dynamic and energetic young leaders of our time. By sheer determination and incredibly hard work, Anthony Fox vividly demonstrates that the mantle of leadership is not reserved solely for the old. He combines great talent with great vision and a greatness of spirit. He is the youngest mayor of North Carolina's largest city, where he has helped to inspire a new generation of Americans to believe again in the ennobling possibilities of civic engagement and ethical leadership. We look forward to hearing from him tonight. We're especially indebted to the Joseph M. Bryan Foundation for their generosity in making these lectures available and possible. The Bryan Lectures are an enormous enrichment to our program of legal education as Elon continues to build a law school committed to leadership and civic engagement. We thank the Bryan Foundation for making these lectures possible, and we thank all of you for coming out tonight. Now, Andrew Rellon, a second year student and a leadership fellow at Elon University School of Law, will introduce our guest and speaker. Good evening. Students, faculty, and members of the Greensboro community, I welcome you to Elon Law tonight for the Bryan Leadership Lecture. One week ago, many of us had our eyes anxiously gazed upon television screens as we saw poll election results begin to trickle in. We were curious, under whose leadership would our governmental systems be led? We cast our ballots for the persons who inspired us to be better citizens, motivated us to be a better people, and inspired us to do more for others. One such person is our guest speaker here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Anthony R. Fox, Mayor of Charlotte, North Carolina. Upon his election in 2009, Fox became the youngest mayor in the city's history. He was reelected to a second term last year. As mayor, Fox has focused on strengthening Charlotte's economy by establishing the city as an energy hub. He developed a system to support the country's fastest growing economy in an urban area. He has worked towards creating an environment in which small businesses and entrepreneurs can thrive. Mayor Fox earned his bachelor's degree in history at Davidson College, where he was the first African-American student body president. He then went to New York University School of Law, where he was a Root Tilden Scholar, the university's prestigious public service scholarship. Since law school, Mayor Fox has served as a law clerk for the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. He, was, he has been a trial attorney for the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice and staff counsel to the United States House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary. The student body of Elon Law is, is excited to welcome you to our law school, Mayor Fox, because we believe in and embrace the leadership responsibilities of our profession. And we respect and appreciate your leadership in the law and in the public arena. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Honorable Anthony R. Fox. Good evening and thank you very much, Andrew, for that wonderful introduction. And to uh, Dean George Johnson, thank you very much. Um, 
Dean Johnson and I have already established a, uh, a connection. Um, the NYU Law School basketball team beat the Columbia University Law School basketball team. He's not happy with me, but uh, nevertheless, um, what a wonderful dean you all are privileged to have here. To um, Elon University President Leo Lambert, I want to thank you uh, very much um, for visiting with me earlier, as well as your wife. Um, and um, to the uh, wonderful Joseph M. Bryan uh, Foundation, I want to say thank you for offering uh, this uh, wonderful, distinguished uh, leadership speaker series, because I think leadership is something that all of us um, continue to study and hopefully continue to practice in our everyday lives. And it's always good to have a view from the bench, so to speak, of people who are uh, who are taking on challenges facing our country. I also understand that I'm following in the footsteps of some very distinguished uh, people, and uh, many of whom I know, including Newark Mayor Cory Booker and um, David Gergen. And so I uh, hope to live up to the, the billing that you all have, have, uh, have made. <clears throat> um, I'm going to talk tonight really from the standpoint of, uh, of, of a few stories. And um, I do see one other person I need to acknowledge, who is Justice uh, Henry Fry and his wife Shirley, who are great friends and a great jurist and a great lawyer. So it's great to see you, Justice Fry and Shirley. Great to see you. Um, I'm going to talk about leadership and my life and reflect on um, the topic of leadership from the standpoint of, of three sort of narratives. Because I find that a lot of times when you, when you speak about leadership, you can sound pedantic. Um, and uh, this is a topic that really deserves to be unearthed through narrative. The first story I want to tell you is about the immense power of law to change things for the better. I'm a fifth generation North Carolinian. And I can trace my family back to a seven year old girl who was sold on an auction block in 1860 in Carthage, North Carolina. In those days, our laws treated her as chattel a piece of property to be bought and sold just like a table or another piece of furniture. And in those days, she had no expectation of being treated otherwise. She grew up to have a son who came into the world after the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. While no longer under the scourge of slavery, the family still faced disadvantages, no resources, no education, and thus no prospects for upward mobility. And a generation later, in a small segregated schoolhouse, her son grew to get a fifth grade education using hand-me-down books and a generation later, all 14 of his children went to that same segregated schoolhouse, went on to college, and many of them, like my grandmother, became educators. And in 1954, the Supreme Court decision in Brown desegregated schools and cracked the door open even further for education, enabling the next generation of my family to go even further. I came along in 1971, which was an ex exceptionally good year, uh, particularly because that was the first year that Disney opened. So there was lots of good stuff happening in 1971. But in that same year, the U United States Supreme Court decided a case called Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, a landmark case in which the court affirmed 
busing as a means of implementing Brown. Well, communities all across the country reacted adversely to that decision. There was a lot of controversy in places as north, far north as Boston and all over the south. And while there was, in some cases, a violent reaction to that decision in other parts of the country, that was not quite the case in Charlotte. The reality is, is that in Charlotte, the decision was not popular, and many white families opted out of the school system as a result of it, but there were also many families, black and white, that decided to make the decision work for our city. And so, sitting across lunch, uh, uh, kitchen tables, having discussions with each other, a coalition of families decided to literally make integration work. And in fact, some of the wealthiest families in the city sent their kids to a formerly all-black high school, signaling to the rest of the community that we were going to figure this out. Now, this was something almost unheard of anywhere in the South, but particularly uh, anywhere in the country, but particularly anywhere in the South. But by the time I entered school, the community had gained a reputation as a city that made integration work. And so it is interesting to note that the same system that made it possible for my great-great-grandmother to be sold into slavery later made it possible for me to gain a strong education and five generations later, to be the mayor of the largest city in North Carolina. As a profession, we cannot take the legacy of the law and the effective, progressive changes that the law can engender for granted. I wish for every one of you, particularly the students in this room, that you will take that legacy on in your own practice and in your own life. Because being a lawyer, having the opportunity to weigh in on how justice is dispensed, how cases are argued, who gets represented, those types of opportunities are rare for anyone. And for us as lawyers, we have a unique responsibility towards it. The second story is about being stubborn about your path. I learned that lesson as a 12-year-old, and I told this story upstairs. Uh, as a 12-year-old, I walked into this wonderful science museum called Discovery Place in Charlotte, and I saw these wonderful people who were standing next to these exhibits who were wearing green aprons. They were volunteers, and they knew what seemed like everything about science. And I just wanted to be one of those people. And so I applied to be a volunteer. And I waited a week, and I heard nothing. And so I went back, and I applied again, and waited a week, and it heard nothing. And this became a little expensive, because I was taking the number six bus to go apply. But I kept going back over a series of weeks and weeks until finally I went to Discovery Place one day and saw a crack in the aquarium and decided that I would go in there. And I went in and saw a bucket and squeegee, so I, I started working. And it, I did this for about an hour. And finally, someone came and, and found me and decided to send me up to the executive director's office, and I spent about half an hour talking to her, and in the course of which she said, how old are you? I said, I'm 12. She said, well, we don't allow 12-year-olds to volunteer. You have to be 16. And we talked a little further, and by the end of it, she said, you know, I'm going to let you do this because you've shown such initiative. And I learned that kind of stubbornness from a very early age. It's all about staying the course. 
I had to stay the course again 25 years later when I ran my first campaign for mayor. The previous mayor had been in the office for 14 years. I think you've heard of him. He decided to retire, and he picked a successor who wasn't me. The campaign was grueling. We've just seen one of the most grueling presidential campaigns. I mean, it was grueling for those of us who were watching. I don't know how it felt to those, of us, those who were running. Uh, but they must have had 20-some debates in the Republican primary and three in the general just now. Four years ago, they'd had 28 debates, I think it was, and then three in the general. Well, in my first campaign for mayor, we had 40 debates for mayor of Charlotte, a two-year term. <laughs> So when I say grueling, I mean grueling. And my opponent had an enormous machine behind him. Money, name recognition, it served 20 years in the city. And here I was, youngest guy to run for this office and serve for about four years. It just seemed outmatched. So with only eight weeks to go, I actually had a three to one disadvantage in resources, and everyone was saying I was going to lose. But rather than give up the fight, I actually fought harder. And over the course of that last eight weeks, the three to one disadvantage became parity, and then parity became actually an advantage for me. And by the end of it, I'd won the election, but only because I was stubborn and stayed in the fight. But shortly after the election, I had to stay the course again because despite leading the 17th largest city in the country, despite being the second largest financial services center in the country, despite having the sixth busiest airport in the world, and being an all-around great place. Charlotte was considered an underdog when it came to hosting the Democratic National Convention. During the course of the convention, I was pretty relentless. During this time, I must have seen the president about eight times or more. And every time I saw the president, I said the same thing, Mr. President, I'm Mayor Anthony Fox from Charlotte. We would like to host the Democratic National Convention. I mean, I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Head of State, <laughs> but the Robin Givens character who just sort of always crops up, that's the way, uh, that's the way it felt to the president, I'm sure. So I said this to the president, you know, I don't know how many times, three, four, five. So the last time I say it to him, I say, Mr. President, Mayor Anthony Fox from Charlotte, and, and he stopped me and he said, I know you want to host a Democratic <laughs> convention. <clears throat> That's what it takes, being relentless about what it is you want to accomplish. And I wish for all of you that when you identify endeavors that are important to you, that you will stay with it, even when you feel pushed against the wall of futility, that you'll find the resilience you need to accomplish your goals. The last set of stories I want to tell have to do with owning your career. And this is really the most important point. Um, I grew up in a family of teachers. My grandfather was a principal. My grandmother taught French. I have aunts and uncles that were all educators. And when I sat down to go to college and I talked to my grandparents about what I might do, they strongly encouraged me to consider something outside of the family business. 
simply because they felt like maybe I could do something a little beyond what everyone else was doing. So I went along in school and in life. And what's funny about life is that, particularly when you're in school, there are always merit badges out there. You know, there's uh, summa cum laude, there's uh, honorary societies, there's all kinds of stuff that you can aspire to. And you aspire to that, and then when you get there, there's the next thing to aspire to. And there's a path of, it's almost like Hansel and Gretel, the breadcrumbs are just laid out for you, and you just keep following the breadcrumbs. Well, when you get out of here, and you've picked up all the breadcrumbs, what you start to discover is that the prize at the end of the trail is really defined by you. And that if you continue waiting for someone else to lay a breadcrumb for you, uh, you're not going to get very far. Or maybe you get really far and decide that where you are isn't where you want it to be. Well, I sort of found myself in that place. I was working at a law firm, doing quite well, enjoying law practice, um, but feeling like there was something missing in my day to day. And when I thought about it, what I realized was, while I didn't necessarily want to do exactly what my grandparents were doing, because my grandfather would have kids coming over the house all the time doing extra homework and He'd be helping people apply for college and all kinds of stuff. But what I realized was, what I missed was the sense of ownership my grandparents felt for the community around them. See, my life was very self-contained. I could go to work, come back home, watch Homeland, you know, put my kids to bed, a nice existence, but it was disconnected from the world around me. And what I realized was, was that sense of connection was something that made me tick. So I went to my law firm and I said, look, I've had a, uh, I've, I've had a revelation. I need to go run for city council in 2005, and um, eyebrows raised, people sort of looked, thought about it, and said, okay, you know, just get your work done, go do it. It was not a situation where my public service was, um, uh, where my, my private practice was reduced, it was a situation in which my public service was an addition. So for four years, I did that. And then I had another revelation. I said, you know, I want to go run for mayor. And at that point, what was very clear was that I had to start making some decisions about how to navigate this professional life with, with my public service uh, desires. And frankly, I've made those adjustments and haven't looked back. Now, I say that to you because there are crossroads in your futures. There are points of decision that you will face. And what I think is the most important thing and what is sometimes the hardest thing for people who are achievers is settling down and really understanding what it is that will make you happy, what it is that will fulfill you. And when you decide and figure that out, the pathway makes itself. I'm convinced um, that had I not made that decision when I made it, um, a lot of great things would not have happened in Charlotte. And frankly, a lot of the feeling of fulfillment I have that I can relate directly back to my grandparents, I would not have. 
And so I wish for you the ability to not only be great achievers, but to be people who understand that achievement in the context of who you are, because that is the most important thing. So I've touched on what I think leadership means, particularly for lawyers. It means understanding that you were part of a legacy of people who engage on issues that advance society. That you have a, a responsibility to figure out for yourself what makes you happy, what drives your passion, and to direct your energies there. And you have a responsibility to be stubborn about it. And when you put that combination of things with your intellect and your other gifts, you will have great futures. And so I'd like to end right there uh, and thank you all for being uh, great listeners tonight. Thank you. All right. So now it's time for some questions. Yes, sir. It's been said that a tradition is anything you do twice. Do you think North Carolina will have a tradition of having uh, governors come from the city of Charlotte? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think of something clever to say is escaping me. <laughs> we'll see. I, I think um, our state is changing right in front of our eyes, and it's not just demographic changes. It is also um, a trend of urbanization, uh, a trend of in migration from all parts of the country and the world. Our economy is moving at breakneck speed um, in terms of reinventing into areas like tech. Um, even financial services becoming more diverse by the day. Healthcare, energy. We're starting to see uh, a new North Carolina emerging. Um, and I, I do think that the first Charlotte mayor in 92 years to be governor um, will lay a bit of a foundation one way or the other on how people view folks who have an urban pedigree in the role of governor. Um, so um, I hope that the governor-elect does a great job um, and that uh, people are open to that in the future, um, but we'll have to see. Uh, it's going to be an interesting four years. Yeah. Um, are you full time now, or do you still practice law? I mean, is your mayorship a full time position? I'm part time, part time. So, part time mayor, part time lawyer. Full time dad. You know, I, this is a question about the diversity of roles that lawyers may play in, in coming years. You know, the reality is lawyers, there's so much you can do with a law degree, and people have been doing diverse things forever. Um, Y'all are probably too young to remember Howard Cosell, who was a great uh, sports <laughs> announcer, but he was a lawyer. Um, who, who knew? Um, and uh, you see that some of the, uh, the top-ranking executives in places like the National Football League and the National Basketball Association are lawyers. Um, um, out of the context of sports, you can look at uh, television oftentimes. And if you happen to be in Los Angeles when OJ gets arrested, perhaps you'll have your own TV like Greta Sustrand. Um, there are lots of careers that lawyers have. And the reason why is because, as lawyers, one of the basic skill sets is distilling disparate information into its essence. And that's why the skill of being a lawyer has so much, so much um, 
marketability in the marketplace. Uh, I do think you're going to see more lawyers um, who are establishing uh, their own practices. You're going to see more uh, focus on entrepreneurship, and I know you, you have an emerging program in that area, which I think is spot on uh, in terms of what the economy is, is bringing. Um, but I, I think you're going to see lawyers playing a variety of roles in a lot of places. And by the way, I've talked a lot about public service, but uh, just to make a little pitch on that for a second, we are at a, a low over the last, and I don't know what the stat I saw was, but it, over the last 50 years or something, we have fewer lawyers engaged as elected officials at the state level than we've seen in quite some time. And if you think about it, I mean, forget whether we agree or disagree on issues. The skills that lawyers bring to the legislative process are invaluable, and we need lawyers engaged in public service. So uh, I think you're going to have a lot of breadth there. One other postscript to that question, though, and it's true of any profession, is that right now every profession is changing so quickly that for your generation, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to be thinking about, actually for all of us, we're going to have to be innovators every day. Um, I was reading a book by Thomas Friedman. Uh, you may have read it. It's, uh, uh, it's a book that I can't remember. Um, it is um, his most, most recent book, um, That Used to Be Us. That's what it was. Um, and in that book, he talks about surveying partners in a large law firm and talking about how they dealt with the recession and the reality of actually letting lawyers go, who they kept and who they didn't keep. And what he says is that the people who got kept were people who reinvented their, their job, uh, who could figure out a way to take the skill set they had and translate that skill set into uh, something that the clients needed, whether it was in um, transactional work, uh, you know, going from uh, asset securitization to workouts and, and bankruptcies, Whatever it happened to be, the lawyers who were aggressive and had their own uh, sense of how they could translate their skills became the ones that were keepers. And so I commend that to you from the standpoint that um, it is not just enough to get in the door and have a job. Uh, we all have to be reinventing our jobs every day in this economy, and that's as true of lawyers as anyone else. Yes, sir. Lawyer role models. Um, I've had so many role models as lawyers. I'll, from a very, very, very far distance, um, the person who probably made me want to be a lawyer was Thurgood Marshall um, because of the stories I would hear about. This guy graduated from the University of Baltimore, uh, uh, Howard University Law School, and had gone off with Charles Hamilton Houston and argued all of these cases in the 30s and the 40s seeking to um, redress some of the racial segregation that existed in our society and who frankly had to argue cases um, in hostile courts many times because the outcome he was seeking was an outcome that, that uh, society wasn't, wasn't quite ready for. And how you have the courage to go make those arguments in an environment that is so hostile, uh, spoke to a sen the sense of courage. I had heroes closer to home, like Julius Chambers, who uh, was a fine lawyer who uh, established himself, actually argued the Swan case that I talked about before. Um, Mel Watt was a, a family friend. His wife is a uh, distant cousin of mine, so I knew him growing up and uh, developed uh, a, a sense uh, of that. And then there were um, lawyers along the way that I met in, in law school. Um, I met um, Derek Bell in, in law school, who was a great law professor, um, uh, and, and Randy Hertz, who was my clinical professor in, um, in, in law school, who was a great, uh, great teacher of trial skills, and Tony Amsterdam, who was my advisor in law school, was one of the seminal uh, professors of cl clinical law uh, across the world. So I've had great influences um, there. And of course, the judge I clerked for in the Sixth Circuit, Nathaniel Jones, who's now retired. So uh, I've had uh, everything from the distant hero worship to the close up hero <laughs> worship. And it's all played out in who I've tried to be. Yes, sir. 
I've known you for a while. The question is how important is maintaining access to legal services to our society? It is fundamental, um, and it's getting harder. It's fundamental because the yin-yang of our justice system requires there to be a yin and a yang. <laughs> and uh, if there's only yin, justice can't really function effectively. Um, harder because some of the funding mechanisms, either through government or even private sector uh, fundraising, have become harder to support. And um, you know, when when money dries up in in government coffers, you start looking at what's essential and what's not essential. And uh, sometimes, the judgment is made that resources for things like uh, public defenders or legal services or, or whatever it happens to be are expendable. The cost comes on an as-applied basis. It's the person who gets um, wrongfully evic evicted or uh, who faces an issue with their kid being expelled unfairly from, from school or, or whatever it is or someone uh, being arrested and having a real legitimate case that that arrest was, was wrongful. So. Um, that kind of gap is a gap that, uh, that, that creates a real problem for society because what happens is people lose their faith in justice because of the way it's set up. So um, that's a challenge that we face as a society. Um, I will say that I, I, I am forever humbled by, by the fact that despite all of the warts and things that may exist in reality within our justice system, that the supremacy of the law is something that most of us have a great deal of respect for, and the, the, the courts. Um, and I, I, I think that is a part of the fabric of our democracy that is so critical uh, that has to continue to be reinforced generation after generation. Yes, sir. Oh, sure. Um, how many of you are thinking of coming to law school? Wow, OK. A um, couple of thoughts about this. Um, remember, I came from a family of teachers. I didn't have a single lawyer in my family. And to talk to you about how passionately I felt about becoming a lawyer, I'm going to confess something publicly I've never confessed before which is that, you know those books that you get that have like the, the law schools in them and the, s the scores and the descriptions, you know, barons and whatever else there is. I bought all of those books. I combed all through them. I literally, you know, I, I will say that I'm sure that at some point along the way I slept with one under my pillow. I mean, you know, I felt really strongly about this. And the reason why is because what you're, what you're seeking by entering this profession is you're seeking the privilege of being um, a participant in our justice system, in the development of our laws, in the interplay that goes on between how we, if you're in private practice, how we service a client's needs by developing novel approaches to solving problems, to how we make an argument in front of a judge, to how we advise a client if you're in-house working someplace. It's a privilege. And it is a privilege that, frankly, 
as a young person, I associated more with nice clothes and cars, but as an older person, I appreciate from the standpoint of what it means to society to have people who care deeply about not just the outcome, but what goes into the process of making law. Um, I like the fact that there are at least two sides to an argument. You know, even if I have one that I take as mine, I think that's good for our society. Um, so I, you know, I, I think the encouraging word I would give you is that I don't know of any profession that can have as dramatic an impact on an entire society as the legal profession. It's a hefty responsibility, but it is a glorious privilege to have. Yeah. Yes. Well, at the local level where I am, um, we're a little insulated from the exchange questions, but, but the expansion of coverage does have a budgetary impact on local government. It's, you know, on a $1.7 billion budget. Um, it's not a, a rounding error uh, for us, but it is a significant, you know, it's, probably on the order of a million or two million dollars of impact on our budget to, to carry forth the coverage responsibilities that we have. Um, having said that, more generally on the, um, the Affordable Care Act, one of the challenges this, this bill is trying to address is the fact that we've seen huge escalation in health care costs annually, year after year after year that are costly to both employers, employees, and to government because government pays the bill for a large number of people through Medicare and Medicaid. So the goal of the program, as I understand it, isn't, isn't I don't think anyone endeavors to reduce costs, you know, net costs. Um, I think the goal of it is to slow the increase in health care costs by focusing on things like prevention, um, by uh, eliminating the ability of insurance companies to take larger percentages of premiums and put those in their pockets and actually redistribute those in terms of actually providing coverage to people um, and expanding the set of people who are actually covered by insurance and maybe they will get care at an earlier point before they get to a point where they're so sick that it, it's, it's hugely expensive. So. Um, one can argue the pros and cons of that approach, but I think that's what the goal of the of the of the, the plan I I is to accomplish. Yeah. Hi, Mayor. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Good seeing you. Um, I was just going to mention as a member that I was super nervous when you asked about running for city council the last time. Great to see you. We miss Susan. Yeah. Um, when I read your bio, my observation was that you seem to have seen a lot of problems and see it all down the road. I hope people are still saying that. <laughs> and assuming you agree with that, um, I was curious if you had any observations as to why that might be. Well, I think part of the reason why Charlotte has been so successful is because its relationship to the private sector is much different than, than you find in almost any other city. Um, we have had a great run of, of business leaders who've been civic-minded and who've partnered with us to do things like reinventing our urban core, supporting us through the Chamber of Commerce and through individual um, acts of courage to build the first fixed rail transit system in North Carolina, which, which we're working to expand even as we speak. Um, a lot of times in cities you find that the private business community is working across purposes with the public sector leaderships, 
leadership and, and they, they, don't, they don't have common space that they, where they're working together. And Charlotte's actually been able to, um, to avoid many of those challenges. Charlotte is also takes pride in, in being exceptionally well managed. We, we, we've, we're a AAA bond rated city. Um, we spend an awful lot of time, energy, and attention on uh, maintaining our infrastructure and um, keeping our streets clean, for example, uh, keeping our tree canopy strong, creating places where people will want to go congregate and, and, and recreate, um, and also creating um, opportunities for, frankly, economic development to occur. Now, what's happened over the last 40 years, as I was saying to the, to the leadership uh, group upstairs, is going to challenge us over the next 40 years. Um, we've got a lot of challenges. Every city in North Carolina is going to have challenges. But our challenges are that, we, we, first of all, we can't grow by annexation anymore. We can't grow our tax base by growing out. So we've got to grow up. We've got we've to find a way to, to incent infill development to invite new population into the urban core of the city. And frankly, we've got to reinvent some parts of our urban core to make them inviting enough to attract that population. Otherwise, our risk is that we will see that population move into the outlying areas and we will start to see the cycle of population loss that you see in some of these other cities. Uh, that's a struggle for us right now because um, improving the city means paying more money at a time when people don't want to pay more money, but leaving it the same risks the reality that I just spoke about. So um, the life of a city always presents new challenges. That happens to be the challenge of the moment for our city, but it's had a great run, and I think we'll continue having a great run. Yes, sir. Great. Yeah, well, great question. The most important question every level of government is asking itself right now because there, there is a, there's an illness of polarization that's gotten deeply into our politics. And um, what's absent right now is this, this idea that um, some of something is better than all of nothing, which is where we got to with the last deficit reduction discussions. Um, no one ended up looking particularly good after that, that was over. Um, I, I, think, I, I think that um, we are somewhat polarized because of the way our districts are drawn. Um, and you, you know, it's unfortunate that even in 2012, you can, you can draw lines around neighborhoods and you can pretty much predict that a Democrat's going to win there and a Republican's going to win over here. And when you do that, what happens is the subgroups within a party then start to have more sway over who wins that particular seat. So uh, you've got that on both sides, and that is a, is a problem. Now, the president can't argue that case and Congress can't argue that case once everyone's elected. They're elected to serve. I don't think that you can answer the question of a deficit reduction without someone saying, I am willing to accept something that you want, but only if you will accept these one or two things that I want. And um, I think some of that happened during the last round of discussions. Um, but quite frankly, what's about to happen is, is I, I think the president's going to be under enormous pressure to sell some 
reductions or some changes in entitlements to, to his friends. And John Boehner is going to be under enormous pressure to sell increased revenue to his friends. And um, they're going to have to find a way to do that. And uh, I think sometimes it's not just leaders from different parties coming together and coming up with an idea. It is then going out to their various constituencies and making the case to their constituencies that that idea is actually a good idea for them. I do think the country is tired of the polarization. Um, frankly, I don't think our economy can take a shock wave like going over the fiscal cliff. But um, it remains to be seen as to whether, particularly the Congress, in my opinion, um, can get over the politics of this and actually get to an answer. But I, you know, I think that's the best one can hope. David Gergen, who I know has a great relationship to the law school, would say that America is great at dealing with the wolf at the door, but we're not good at dealing with the termites in the basement. And um, you know, in in many ways, a lot of these, a lot of these issues that we're talking about are termite in the basement issues, and um, uh, they're issues that have to be dealt with before the wolf comes. Answered all your questions? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for gracing us with your presence and your thoughts on leadership. And thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out tonight. Good night. <laughs>